blockade of America. Is that was little more than the country east of the Mississippi together with a distant colonial settlement called California. In between, little besides millions of empty acres. The story begins in the Senate of the United States. The year, 1857. The speaker, Senator Gwynn of California. And what of our fellow Americans in far off California with only an uncertain mail service? wandering across 2,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean to Panama, and then across an alien country to the Pacific. Is it any wonder, then, that Californians planning a trip to the East speak of going to America? Going to America. That Americans should be forced to think and feel like this is the shame of our government. Shame that can only be extinguished by an overwhelming vote in favor of the bill now before you. A bill which establishes a speedy overland mail route across America and entirely within American territory. A bill which at last brings the state of California socially and spiritually within the American Union! And be it enacted that the Postmaster General be, and he is hereby authorized, to contract for the conveyance of the entire letter mail from such point on the Mississippi River as the contractors may select to San Francisco in the state of California. Senator? Inasmuch as you are the uh, godfather, so to speak, of this entire project, it gives me great satisfaction to introduce to you Mr. John Butterfield, whose bid for the overland mail service I accepted this morning. Mr. Butterfield. Very honored, Destiny Senator. Destiny has chosen you to be a great benefactor to California, Mr. Butterfield. And a great convenience to me, too. <laughs> Next time I come to Washington, Mr. Butterfield's coaches will whisk me through in just a couple of weeks. Uh, not as fast as that, I'm afraid, sir. Why not? The schedule for St. Louis calls for 25 days. 25 days? Why, that's four weeks to New York. That's very little faster than the ocean mail today. Uh, yes, sir, but... Uh, Butterfield has been in the staging business for very many years, Senator, and uh, when he says he can make the distance in less, I'm inclined to accept his word for it. Well, I do not, Mr. Postmaster. 25 days for 1,900 miles. 2,800 miles, sir. I have crossed the Overland Trail seven times, Mr. Butterfield. It is 1,900 miles from San Francisco to Westport Landing. Uh, yes, sir, by the Overland Trail, sir. Uh, Senator, the uh, route that I have selected as Postmaster General is not the Overland Trail. Then in heaven's name, what is it? Oh, this is the route, Senator. Now I understand you perfectly, a southern route. Almost a thousand miles longer, but a southern route. Uh, gentlemen, I know about staging, I know about horse flesh, but uh, I don't know anything about politics. So with your kind permission, I will take my leave. Mr. Butterfield, as an expert in these things, do you think that is the proper route to California? I can't rightly say, sir. You can, Mr. Butterfield, because you are an expert in these things. But whether it is proper for you to do so, that is quite another matter. Don't you worry. You get the mail through on time. I'll take care of the route and the politics. Thank you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Butterfield. Wonderful character, Butterfield. Overstaged out of Albany when he was 16 years of age. Why did you not choose the Overland Trail? Well, there's many disadvantages, Senator. In the first place, uh, well, in the first place, there's the Indians. There are Indians on every route across America. And on the Overland Trail, there's, uh, well, there's also the snow. Now, I've been informed that the winter snow in the Sierras would make staging extremely hazardous. Mr. Brown, let us be open about this. You were thinking neither of the Indians nor of the snow. 
And you were thinking far beyond just the location of a mail route because you know that where the mail goes, the telegraph goes, and the railroad goes, and the route that you choose sets the entire pattern for the development of the West. Yes, Andrew, we all know that. You were choosing this route for one reason only, to ensure that our country shall be opened up by the southern states exclusively. Mr. Brown, you are postmaster, not of the southern states, but of the United States of America. And it should not be a question of the South against the North, or of your prejudices or your preferences, but simply a question of what is best for America. Well, what is best, in your opinion? That the West should be opened up as speedily and efficiently as possible. And this can only be accomplished if we set aside politics and select the natural highway across America, the Overland Trail. Well, I'm right sorry you don't agree with me, Senator, but your opinion won't matter now because... Uh... The contract for the mail route was signed this morning. I see. In this contract, Mr. Brown, you have written the future history of the American West. I think you have written it wrong. I shall do everything in my power to thwart your plans. Very well, Senator. But I don't think you'll succeed. And at first, Senator Gwynne did not succeed. In spite of violent opposition, the Butterfield Overland Mail began. The New York press dubbed its meanderings the Great Oxbow Route and the Chicago Tribune condemned it as one of the greatest swindles ever perpetrated on the country. And a reporter from a St. Louis paper was sent to a wagon train on the prairie to interview the man who perhaps knew most about the Overland Trail, Alexander Majors. Know what today is? Sunday, sir. I don't hold with working on the Sabbath. As you see, I, I rest my wagon trains on this day. Yes, sir. Now, man, how's the stew? About ready, okay. Mr. Majors. Oh, young man, you've got a job to do, and you've ridden a long way to find me. I don't force my beliefs in any man. Come on, sit down. Thank you, sir. Well, now, what can I do for you? Well, my editor feels that you know about the Overland Trail, sir. Yes, I know a little. At the present moment, we've got over 3,000 wagons along the way with 4,000 bullwhackers and 40,000 oxen. And we're running coaches as far as Pike's Peak, besides. Oh, I don't know Broadway and State Street. Don't think I'd like them even if I did. But you can safely say I know the Overland Trail. Oh, uh, will you join us? Oh, thank you, sir. Antelope stew. Don't know whether you'd like it. But it's a change in the prairie from salt, pork, and bacon. Mr. Majors, this controversy about the mail contract, did you expect it to go by the Overland Trail? No, I did not. Why not, sir? Because, for some reason, our fellow countrymen in the East have never known much about the Overland Trail. When it was as familiar as the palm of your hand to every trapper and fur trader in the West, they were still sending out fellows from Washington to explore it. <laughs> it's just the same thing today. Do you think any man, Jack, can believe that in this year we're transporting across America 12 million pounds of freight? Well, I do know this. That in God's own good time, the Overland Trail will come into its own. And the United States Mail will pass across the very spot where we're now sitting. And the telegraph. And the railroad. And civilization. Because God made the Overland Trail the great natural highway across America. We cannot long defy him. Doesn't... Uh... Politics enter into it too, sir? Of course it does, but God's hand must be in politics too. Though I must say, sometimes it's hard to believe. Now, young man, don't you talk to me about politics. I don't know anything about it. I wear frontier clothes and I just think it's my partner wears city suits and handles politics. Bill Russell. That's the man you ought to talk to in Washington. Come in. Hello, Senator. Good I don't have to ask why you're here. 
When you arrive, it's always because you've had an idea for getting the mail on the Overland train. Well, it's a good one this time, Russell, but it uh, depends on you. Have some coffee and tell me about it. Thanks. I've given up hope of doing anything through Congress. There's only a minority against us, but the Southerners are organized and they're determined. And a determined minority is hard to beat. I've decided to appeal to a higher court, the Court of Public Opinion. You politicians are always appealing to that court in your speeches. But how does it work? How do you make that court take action? In this case, you can make it work by doing something so spectacular and so dramatic that the public will demand the Overland Trail. Go on, Senator. The spectacular and dramatic always fascinate me. That's what my partners complain about. I couldn't sleep last night, Russell, so uh, I started reading this book. History of China from the earliest times. Very interesting. Very interesting. Especially the part about Genghis Khan. Did you know, Russell, that Genghis Khan's courier service in the 12th century was very much faster than anything we have in the West today? That's a fact. With Genghis Khan's system, he could have covered the Overland route in two weeks. Well, if Genghis Khan could do it in two weeks, Russell Majors and Waddell can do it in ten days. What was the system? Very simple. No lumbering six-horse coaches. You don't need that just for letters. Relays of ponies bred for speed every ten miles or so, with light, daring young men to ride them night and day at a full gallop. Russell, I want you to start a Pony Express across America. Pony Express? Pony Express. Senator, I told you, the spectacular and dramatic always fascinate me. Have determined to establish a Pony Express to California, commencing the 3rd of April. Time, 10 days. And then, of course, in return for our enterprise, the Senator promises to get us the mail contract as soon as the public start demanding the Overland Trail. And how long will that be? Oh, say a year. And in the meantime, we shall be running the Pony Express at our own expense? Good heavens, Waddell. Don't always throw cold water on things. Suppose it does cost us a little bit. Well, how much? I haven't the slightest idea. Well, then you'd better start thinking. Do you know how much the government pays Butterfield to keep him going? I have the figures here. It works out at $60 for every letter. Majors, you know the practical end of this business, and I don't. How much would it cost to run a Pony Express for 18 months? I estimate we'll lose a quarter of a million dollars. Quarter of a million? You see, Russell? And this isn't the first time you've involved our company in fantastic and unprofitable adventures. But this time, I'll have no part of it. As far as I am concerned, we'll stick to solid business enterprises and give up the whole idea of your Pony Express. We're forgetting one thing. Bill, did you give our word to Senator Gwynn? Of course. Well, what difference does that make? Gentlemen, the word of Russell, Majors, and Waddell has been pledged. There's only one honorable thing to do, to fulfill that pledge to the best of our ability. Now, you'll have to excuse me. You've given me only two months to organize a mail route of 2,000 miles. I'd better get to work. And Majors got to work. 500 of the fastest horses in the West had to be bought, for speed was important. Not only to maintain the schedule, but so that the rider could outrun hostile Indians who might try to intercept him. And a special saddle was designed, far lighter than any used before. And over this was thrown the mochila, with leather pockets for the mail. This would save precious minutes, for at the end of his run, the rider had only to drop it over the next rider's saddle, the mochila going from rider to rider across the country like a relay stick. Stage stations had to be built every 15 miles along the route, with stock tenders to take charge of each. And these stations far away from civilization, in the prairies and the mountains, all had to be stocked. Corn and hay for the horses, food and equipment for 300 men. Everything had to be transported down to the last horseshoe nail. Above all, there were riders to be hired. How old are you, son? 21, sir. 119 pounds, Mr. Majors. You know, weight's important. Do you realize the express will be riding most of the time at full gallop? Yes, sir. You'll be riding 75 miles a day, perhaps twice that in an emergency? 
Yes, sir. You'd be living in great discomfort, miles away from civilization. Nothing but Indians, buffaloes, and prairie dogs around you. Yes, sir. Think it over for a moment. Still want to ride the express? More than anything in the world, sir. Good for you, my boy. Raise your right hand. Read that. I do hereby swear before the great and living God that while I am in the employ of Russell, Majors, and Waddell, I will not use profane language, that I will not drink intoxicating liquors, that I will not treat animals cruelly, nor do anything else that is in incompatible with the conduct of a gentleman, and that I will bear true and faithful allegiance to the United States of America. So help me God. So help you God. On April 3rd, 1860, 49 letters left St. Joseph, Missouri by the first Pony Express. For 10 days and 10 nights, those 49 letters were galloped across America, pausing only momentarily as horse or rider was changed. Across the wide Missouri, and then into the valley of the Platte River, happy hunting ground of the fur trappers who lived with the beaver because men in the East had to have beaver hats. Past tiny frontier settlements, growing fewer and sparser as each mile was galloped off along the trail. Then to Julesburg, last trading post before what was called the Great American Desert. After Julesburg, only Indian country. Hundreds of miles of open plains with no living creature besides Indian train slowly setting its course to California. Then the steep climb up the defiant Rockies and through Utah territory past Brigham Young's courageous outpost the only real town in the 2,000 miles between the Missouri and California. Then down into the Great Basin of the Washoe, a murderous desert still uncharted and not yet christened Nevada. And on to Carson City, a city still so small that at their dances the whole population can only muster three sets for a quadrille. Then up once again past the threatening furies of the snow-covered Sierra Nevadas, terrifying and implacable, until on the 10th day, the 49 letters begin at last to descend the sunny Pacific Slope, through gay Placerville and the fertile Sacramento, and on to the one and only San Francisco. San Francisco went wild, for the Pony Express had cut time in two, and San Francisco was now only half as far from the rest of America as it had been the day before. And this had been achieved entirely by the individual enterprise of free men, by the determination of Senate, by the enthusiasm of William Russell, and the patient labor of Alexander Majors. For 79 weeks, the Pony Express was the glory of America and the wonder of the world. To the dismay of the opponents of the Overland Trail, only one mail during that time failed to arrive. For contrary to their predictions, neither the storms of winter nor the hostility of the Indians could stop the Pony Express. Though many a time a rider galloped in and found his station burnt, the station keeper dead and the stock stolen. And sometimes, to the rider too, death came. No wonder that the Pony Express rider became within a few months part of the legend of America. But his most enduring tribute came not from the dime novel, but from a young man who was crossing the prairies on a Pikes Peak stage. A young man to be afterwards famous as Mark Twain. All our interest was taken up in stretching our necks and waiting for the pony rider. He was usually a little bit of a man, brimful of spirit and endurance. He rode 50 miles without stopping, by daylight, moonlight, or starlight, or through the blackness of darkness. He rode a splendid horse that was born for a racer and fed and lodged like a gentleman. He kept him at his utmost speed for 10 miles. And then, as he came crashing up to the station, the transfer of rider and mailbag was made in the twinkling of an eye. 
and away flew the eager pair and were out of sight before the spectator could get hardly the ghost of a look. There were about 80 pony riders in the saddle all the time, night and day, stretching in a long procession from Missouri to California, 40 flying eastward and 40 towards the west, and among them making 400 gallant horses earn a stirring livelihood and see a good deal of scenery every single day of the year. Presently, the driver exclaims, here he comes. Away across the endless dead level of the prairie, a black speck appears against the sky. In a second, it becomes a horse and rider, sweeping towards us, nearer and nearer, growing more and more distinct, more and more sharply defined. Nearer, nearer still, and the flutter of the hoofs comes faintly to the ear. Another instant, at a hoop and a hurrah from our upper deck, and man and horse burst past our excited faces and go swinging away like the belated fragment of a storm. Yet it was the very success of the Pony Express that wrote its own death sentence. For where the Pony had shown the way, the telegraph followed along the overland trail. And soon, the Pony Rider began to pass strange company on his way. Where the Pony Express had broken records in nine days, the telegraph would soon flash across the overland trail in nine seconds. And when the thin line of wire was completed, the Pony Express would be dead. I've just sent my first telegram across America. To all stations, in consequence of the completion of Overland Telegraph, discontinue immediately Pony Express service. Do you want to know how much it has cost us? Just as Majors warned you it would, almost exactly a quarter of a million dollars. So that's the end of the Pony Express. You know, it may be just the beginning. We kept our word. We showed our countrymen God's great highway across America. Because the Pony Express, we now have the telegraph, and after the telegraph will come the railroad and whatever new forms of transportation our future generations may invent. And in those desolate wastes where our wagon trains corral, there'll be prosperous farms, flourishing cities, American homes. No. I don't think America will ever forget the Pony Express. Mm -hmm.